Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the White House. I'm Susan Rice. I'm President Biden's domestic policy advisor, and it's my job to drive the president's domestic policy agenda, from health care and education to racial justice and housing policy. And in this role, I see every day how mental illness, often exacerbated by social media and other factors, is a force multiplier across so many of our most pressing challenges as a nation. And I see the urgency of tackling our youth mental health crisis, not only as a White House official, but also as a mother of two young people, actually two young adults now. Recently, I sat down with another group of young mental health champions. One young woman, a high schooler, who'd watched her friend struggle with thoughts of suicide, said to me, and I quote, mental health is treated as an alien concept. We have to normalize it. Well, today we're here to normalize. We're here to mobilize. We're here to take action to address our nation's youth mental health crisis. President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden are deeply committed to tackling this crisis, a commitment that is reflected in our national strategy for transforming how we understand, access, and treat mental health in America. But this is not a problem that government can solve alone. And that's why the White House and the Department of Health and Human Services have spent months teaming up with your organizations and the incredible group of young advocates here today, mental health leaders who've launched podcasts and designed apps, advocates who've elevated this issue on social media and at the United Nations, courageous young people who've taken their experiences with an eating disorder or bipolar disorder and found new and innovative ways to help others who may be going through the very same thing. As we head into Mental Health Action Day tomorrow, our administration will continue acting urgently to address this youth mental health crisis. And with your help, we can meet this moment and get Americans the care they need and deserve. Now let's check out this video and get ready to meet our outstanding youth leaders. I wish that more people understood. Mental health affects all ages. Has no cultural boundaries. Is just as important as physical health. I wish more people understood. That it's okay to ask for help. And that we could do better for ourselves. And each other. I am the founder and executive director of Letters to Strangers, the largest global youth for youth mental health nonprofit. I started my website in 2020 to help increase visibility to mental health issues, specifically to BIPOC communities. I'm providing mental health first aid training to coaches and trainers across the country. I am the president of my school's mental health club. I'm providing accessible resources to the deaf and disabled communities. I'm getting ready to launch my own movement that will focus on supporting diverse communities. As the U.S. Youth Observer to the United Nations, I've been working with young people across the United States and across the globe to talk about mental health and see what we can do as a generation to create a community of change makers. I do research looking at how we can leverage technology to destigmatize mental health in Asian communities. I make mental health apps. I take techniques that are often taught in therapy and then I distill them into a more accessible digital format. I am making sure that mental health is normalized by running a community-based LLC that uses food and baking to talk about mental health. Me and one of my really close friends founded the Youth Latinx Leadership Conference. I speak at my grandparents' Asian Indian Senior Citizen Center. Being a child of immigrants, I never grew up having mental health conversations. I'm creating content that's culturally specific and speaks directly to others like me. Our generation will be the one to empower people to take action and break the stigma because, because mental, mental health, health is health.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the First Lady of the United States, accompanied by the U.S. Surgeon General, Selena Gomez, and youth mental health leaders. Okay, I guess, yes, there we go. Thank you, and welcome to the White House. You know, I just love seeing so many bright young faces here. There's just so much energy in this room. So thank you for being here. You know, everyone is here today because they have a personal connection to this issue, right? And our nation's Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, has worked hard. Yes, let's give him a round of applause. So Vivek has worked hard to build a movement of support for those who struggle with their mental health. And Selena Gomez. <laughs> has been courageously outspoken about her own challenges. And Selena, I'm so glad that your mom is here. Hello. Where are you, mom? Where is she? She's over there in the oh, corner. There she is. <laughs> Mandy, you must be so proud of your daughter. She's crying. <laughs> <laughs> and all of you on this stage and in our audience are here today because you two have shown incredible resilience and determination to help us find a better way forward. And I hope you all realize really just how special that is. You know, from the schools that are reopened to the businesses that are thriving to unemployment that's falling, we can just look around and see really how far we've come since March of 2020. Think back of where we were back then. You know, our world doesn't feel so small and dark any longer. We're recovering every single day. But recovery isn't always the same as healing. And sometimes the darkness is inside of us too. And over the last decade, an alarming number of young people have struggled with mental health challenges. And the pandemic has made it so much worse, hasn't it? You know, the isolation, the anxiety, and yes, the grief. They are wounds that sometimes go unseen, too often cloaked in secrecy and shame but young people don't have to face these challenges alone. Right, Vivek? No one does. You know, our daughter, Ashley, is a social worker. And she comes, you know, she used to come home every day when we all lived together. 
and tell us about her, the challenges, about the kinds of trauma that she sees in her work. And she, but she also shares the hope she feels when she's able to help. And I know that there are a lot of people here today who offer that same help. And I want to thank all of you here in the audience who do that. So thank you. <laughs> the darkness inside of us can feel heavy at times but we can share the weight of it together. And we can help bring those feelings and experiences into the light. And that's why I'm so grateful to all of you here. It takes courage to you know, be honest about the struggles that you faced and to tell your stories. And it takes courage to understand that your voice can make a difference and to show your creativity and talents you know, to all of the world. So I'm so proud of everyone here today. And the president is proud of you too. In The Hill We Climb, the poem the, that the National Youth uh, Na Poet Laureate, you might remember this from our inauguration, Yes, who doesn't love Amanda Gorman? <laughs> <laughs> so Amanda Gorman wrote, there is always light if we're only brave enough to see it, if we're only brave enough to be it. And I see that illumination in each one of you. So I want you to keep showing up for each other. Keep being brave. I know it's hard and keep helping us find the light that we all need. So thank you all, all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Selena? Oh, dear. <laughs> <sighs> okay, uh, I can't believe I'm here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Biden, um, for inviting all of us here to the People's House. It's such an honor, and you have made all of us feel very welcome, so thank you for that. Um, we have an incredible historic day ahead of us. This is the first ever Mental Health Youth Action Forum, and on this stage are some of the brightest young leaders in mental health advocacy. MTV Entertainment Studios and 18 mental health nonprofit partners, including My Social Impact Initiative, the Rare Impact Fund, selected these 30 young leaders from across the country to offer creative, real world solutions to a crisis that is having a profound impact on so many young Americans. Each of them was selected out of hundreds of applications received because of the impressive work they are already doing to inspire their peers to take mental health action. The Surgeon General's recent adversary on youth mental health shows just how seriously this crisis is being taken by the Biden administration and the Department of Health and Human Services. The document is a comprehensive plan that brings America's attention to this urgent public health issue and provides recommendations for how it can be addressed. Here to tell us more and lead us in a conversation with some of our young leaders is my friend, U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Murthy. Well, thank you so much for those kind words, Selena. And Dr. Biden, I'm so excited and happy that you're here and, and to work so closely with you on this issue that I know we all care about so deeply and that's so important to the president, to issue of how do we improve mental health in our country. You know, the truth is that we are building a movement to address mental health in America. We want to build a society where no person has to feel isolated and shamed because of their struggles. We want to build a world where anyone who needs help can get it and get it quickly. And we're also looking to do something bigger, which is to build a world where we all look out for one another. And it's no secret that when we look at the world right now, sometimes it feels like there's so much division that people are throwing stones at each other, that there's endless conflict. But the reality is that we can change that person by person, interaction by interaction, relationship by relationship. And that's why at the essence of building a movement is not just getting the right policies in place and changing 
practices in schools and in workplaces, we have to do that. But movements are ultimately built and sustained when we change hearts and minds. And that's why each of us has power to use our voice to change how we think, to help shape how the people around us think, and to lead by example. It's one of the reasons I'm so grateful to my friend Selena, because she has led by example in being open and sharing, not just with one or two people, but with millions of people. And think about how scary that is, because sometimes even when we share with one person, you know, that we're struggling, that can feel like so monumentous, you know, so monumental rather, and so scary. Um, to do that at the scale you've done, Selena, is truly, uh, truly impressive, and you've given courage to so many others. And this is just the beginning of what we're all going to be doing together, what all of us in this room will be doing together to build this broader movement on mental health. Uh, and just as we start this conversation, I'm, uh, I was reminded when uh, Dr. Biden read that beautiful quote from Amanda Gorman. I was reminded of uh, a song by one of my favorite bands called Blessings. And there's a, a line in it which says, there are blessings all around us. Open up your eyes. And I think about that often because so many times I forget the blessings that are constantly around us. They often take the form of our family and our friends, of the strangers that we meet. You may meet people today you've never met before. Uh, and I assure you that when you hear from the people on this stage, you will understand why they are blessings, why they are inspiring so many people in their lives and around our country. And we want to lift up their voices because their stories have so much to teach us. So with that, I want us to start with Ayana, who is an extraordinary woman who's here to share with us her mental health journey. Ayana, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. I appreciate it. Uh, so thank you. Um, I am a Afro-Latina, uh, daughter of immigrants from La Republica Dominicana. So this is a big day. It just so happens to be my mother's birthday. Happy birthday, mom, if you're watching. <laughs> um, I am also a mom of two beautiful brown babies, and I am also a disabled veteran. And, um, you know, I really just strive to give people the resources that they need that I wish I had. No one told me how to take care of my brother and my husband when they were going through an episode and taking care of myself and also raising the next generation. And um, you know what I'm most proud of is that my son can tell me, mommy, I wanna tell you my feelings. Can I, can I share with you? And that is, is all I need, so thank you. Ayana, that is so beautiful. And your son and your daughter are so lucky to have such a strong mom, such an honest mom who can be vulnerable and real. Uh, that's incredible. You know, I, I'm asking you this partly selfishly, this question as a dad who has two small kids who are four and five who are growing up. And I'm trying to think, how do I talk to them about mental health? So can you give us some advice? Like when you, when you think about your kids, how do you start those conversations with them about mental health? Oh, tough question. Nobody gave me the book, <laughs> first of all. Um, I just sit down and have a conversation with him and say, how are you feeling today? You know, it's okay if it's not good. And I'm not going to reprimand you or you're not in trouble for feeling a certain way. And if mommy felt you, made you feel a certain way, I want you to tell me. I want to, I want to honor you as an individual and I want to work to be better, right? I just, I'm making myself vulnerable and allowing him the space to, to say, yes, I, I, I feel, you know, I feel sad or I need a break or I need alone time. Can I just say, underscore one thing that Ayanna said is particularly for boys. We don't tell our boys often enough that it's okay to talk about their feelings, that it's okay to express fear and doubt, right? And we've got to do that for kids, you know, across the board. Uh, but I'm so glad that you did that with your son in particular. Wonderful. Thank you, Ayanna. Thank you. I want to turn next to Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine, tell us a little bit about what your journey looks like. Yes. Um, well, I'm going to start off being honest. I am so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but my, so Dose, uh, I'm a member of the Northern Apo tribe from Wyoming. Um, my journey, man, if I would have known, it would have, you know, ended, ended up here. <laughs> um, 
it all really started in high school, um, my freshman year. <laughs> um, it was it was terrible. It wasn't <laughs> very good. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. It's okay. Take your time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I went through you know two different therapists. Um, you know, and that that was a really big step for me. Uh, so because you know where I'm from um, on the reservation, it's not very talked about. You know, the people. And like my peers have, you know, I've been to way too many funerals, <laughs> um, and so I took the the liberty to really, you know, say this isn't okay to, you know, start to really talk about it. You know, um, you know, I don't want anyone to go through, you know, what what they have, and uh, you know, so you know, the two therapists that I went to, they didn't really give me what I wanted uh, or what I needed at the time. And um, so it's just, um, I really had to step up and um, do my own research, create my own positive coping mechanisms. Um, so I started a, a group, a local, a little local group uh, called the Ni'ini Project. Uh, Ni'ini means things are good in the Northern Apo language. Um, we use volunteering and activism as an as a alternative coping mechanism as opposed to just relying on Western medicine. And I, I'm here. <laughs> Jasmine, I know that was hard, yeah. but thank you for sharing so openly and honestly with us. Can I give you a hug? That was amazing. <laughs> Jasmine, I, I want to ask you, you know, it, it was hard for you to find a therapist, as you've said, especially somebody who had experience with indigenous people. And we know that we all have our own stories and our culture matters. Uh, and having someone who understands that matters too. What advice would you have for young people out there who are having a hard time finding a therapist? Yeah, so I, you know, I took really, um, you know, not many have the privilege, but I took comfort in my, my friends and family. They were um, very, very supportive, um, and, you know, it took, it took a little time since, you know, there's still the he heavy stigma around mental health. Um, you know, I also, the, you know, you can just, the advice I would offer is just, you know, really just stay strong, um, and eventually maybe you could find a therapist that you're comfortable with or, you know, that really supports your needs. Um, and, you know, I, I really encourage, uh, you know, activism and volunteering, really putting yourself out there, because yeah, I, I find comfort in helping others. Um, you know, I, some examples, uh, you know, my, I, I had hosted a teddy bear toss at my, at my pretty previous high school. Um, you know, we bagged, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuffed animals. Uh, we donated them to our local domestic violence shelter and a police department to give to kids in need. Um, you know, I also volunteer with uh, Special Olympics. Um, yeah, I'm, I'll be going to USA Games in Orlando to play unified softball with them. So that's that's really nice. Um, and just you know, I I just you know really hope to just you know tell everyone to stay strong. I guess it's easier said than done, but you know, really just just you just got to put yourself out there. Um, I hope to, you know, inspire others to really start this journey too, but yeah. But Jasmine, look how uh, you've turned something that was negative, right, into something so positive. And so you should be so proud of what you're doing. And I hope you keep mentoring other people, you know, in your community that you know and sharing your struggle because I think that's what it's all about really is, you know, mentoring other people to help them through the same struggles that you face. So thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Next, I want to turn to Jorge, who has a, an amazing story as well. Jorge, you became a leader in mental health at Rutgers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd want, can you tell us a little bit more about how that happened? Yes, of course. Well, first and foremost, hello everyone. My name is Jorge Alvarez, and I'm a recent first-generation college graduate from Rutgers University. I had my graduation ceremony this weekend. So, yeah. And I actually studied public health, so it's a pleasure to be in your presence. Um, 
But my journey started my first year. As I mentioned, I'm a first generation college student. So when I went to Rutgers, I didn't really have a lot of guidance or support in all sectors of my life, Acad academia, mental health, you name it. And so for me, my journey really began when I felt very alone, I felt very lost. And because of the cultural stigma and because of you know my mom always saying, what happens in the house stays in the house, um, I didn't really have the chance to share about myself, about my mental health. And it wasn't until June 2018, the end of my first year, where I reflected on why I was feeling so horrible, right? I was experiencing depression, severe anxiety, was diagnosed. And I started to realize that the biggest barrier to entry was not having someone who looked like me, a Latino man at that, talking about mental health, giving me the space, encouraging me to get the help that I needed. And so that was a moment of pivotal change for me when I realized I wanted to create the spaces that I felt like I needed and still need. And so I came across my Active Minds chapter. Active Minds is a mental health nonprofit um, at Rutgers. It was really small at the time, but I saw the potential in it. I saw the potential in using that as a platform, as a space to begin curating further spaces. And we were very upfront you know, when I joined the club um, in changing the narrative to create spaces that are very intentional for black and brown students to speak about their mental health. So we wouldn't just say, this is what self-care is. We'd say, let's talk about intergenerational trauma and how that's impacting black and brown people. And that was really powerful because it was the first time I had a space to speak about my own struggles, but also offer the mic to other people to do the same. And in the three years that I was on that executive board at Rutgers, the club became the largest student-run uh, mental health organization on campus. And we had events where we were bringing out 50, 50 plus people, which if you, go to, if you went to college, you know that's a hard thing to do at, at clubs, <laughs> unless it's a party. So it was, it was a pleasure, for sure. That's incredible, Jorge. I mean, this is, we talked in the beginning about building a movement for mental health. What a beautiful way to help build that movement and bring so many people together. But that's what I wanna ask you about because I, I don't think it's easy, especially in college when people are pulled in so many different directions and people are busy with classes, social events. It's not easy to pull them together, especially to talk about a subject which has still stigma associated with it. How did you do that? How'd you get folks together uh, around this issue? Yeah, so in my reflection, as I mentioned, there was a moment for me where I realized I was always told not to talk about this, but that only led to me going further down this hole that I never wanted to see again. And for me, it was really pushing against everything that I was raised with, right? Pushing against that statement of what happens in the house stays in the house, or what happens in your mind stays in your mind, and going to my friends and just sharing and creating that bridge for then them to feel comfortable enough to share because vulnerability is so powerful and vulnerability is the, uh, like, the enemy to anything that you keep in because the moment that you tap into that, you can share so much and you can build connection. And I think me developing that bridge and forming that connection with my friends started to gradually cause a ripple effect, a domino effect at that where other people felt inspired to share as well. And uh, it wasn't easy. We had a lot of tears and you know we would choke up, but it was beautiful when I started to realize, wow, I'm not so alone anymore and these people understand where I'm coming from. Wow, that's incredible, yeah. thank you. Thank you for sharing. Now I want to go to Dana next. Where's Dana? There she is. There you are, Dana. Uh, Dana, you have one of my favorite stories. You came up with such a unique way uh, to support people with their mental health. T tell us a bit about that. Yes, absolutely. First of all, wow, hi. Um, <laughs> um, I am the creator of an organization called Bake It Till You Make It, which is a community-based organization that uses food and baking to talk about mental health. I mean, if we think back, like, as humans, um, we've been using food as a mechanism to tell stories since the beginning of time. So to me, applying the mental health lens just made so much sense. And another big piece of the organization is using... Um, 
um, authenticity as a way to talk about mental health. For a really long time, I felt like I didn't have any value in the world if I wasn't like bubbly and smiling, like there, um, and realized that tapping into who I really am, my story, it's almost like a responsibility to be that role model. Um, and that has helped me so much in the organization and in my own healing. That's incredible. I, and I love the name, Bake It Till You Make It. That's <laughs> fantastic. You. You, I'm curious, you've, you've taken such a creative approach uh, for people who are also trying to address their mental health needs and aren't finding that the conventional ways work for them. What advice would you give them on how to find that path that may be uniquely suited to them? Yeah. So. Um, to be honest, I'm a terrible baker. <laughs> um, however, <laughs> I have found um, that using food, as, as I said, as a way to tell stories is really what I'm passionate about. And it took me a while to tap into that um, that creative outlet, but then I started to think about what do I love? What, do, what am I good at or not good at? Um, and how do I bring people together? So if you're looking for inspiration, I would say, Think about who you are, what brings you joy, what brings you light, and you can weave in the mental health piece. We all have mental health, and um, you got it from there. Beautiful. <laughs> there are so many beautiful lessons to extract from all of your stories, uh, but a couple I know that I'm going to take away is, you know, Ayana, from yours, the power of leading by example, especially with your kids, and showing them how to talk about mental health. Jasmine, in your case, the power of service, how you have found in helping other people, you are also finding your own strength and assisting them as well. Um, Jorge, like for you, the, just the power of vulnerability, you said, that really stuck with me. And you're exactly right. To be vulnerable takes courage, it takes bravery. We have to change this way of thinking that somehow being vulnerable is a sign of weakness. It's not. It's a sign of strength. And you helped us uh, recognize that once again. And Dana, just uh, for you, I, I love the, the, your last line. Ask yourself what brings you joy. Because we all need more joy in our lives. And we're all going to find it in our own ways. But what a good compass that is to guide us on our mental health journey. So uh, thank you all for these beautiful stories, for inspiring us, for teaching us how to do this. and. Um, you know, you're just you're a great example of how we can build that broader movement uh, to address mental health in America and to make sure, again, that everybody who needs help uh, can get it and to make sure that ultimately that we are there to stand up and step up for one another. So thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. And now I'm going to turn it over to Selena, oh who's going to talk to us about a few I more stories. I heard a phrase actually recently that I really like, that which is mentionable becomes manageable. Um, just to throw in a little bit of my journey, I felt like once I found out what was going on mentally, I found that it was there was more freedom for me to be OK with what I had because I was learning about it. But bringing attention to mental health through media or just by talking about your own journeys can help. It sets the example that it's a topic that can and should be discussed freely and without shame. That's why an event like this, especially at a place like this, is so important. Mental health is very personal for me, and I hope that by using my platform to share my own story and by working with incredible people like all of you, of course you, Dr. Murphy, I can help others feel less alone and find the help that they need, which is honestly all I want. That's why my brand, Rare Beauty, and the Rare Impact Fund support organizations that expand access to mental health services and education for young people. And we partner with mental health experts and nonprofits throughout the year to share free educational resources through Rare Beauty and my own platform. Earlier this month, we hosted our first ever virtual mental health event and over 600 people joined. Um, we talked about the power of your words and the importance of all of our own stories when it comes to talking about and destigmatizing mental health. I want to ensure that everyone, no matter their age, their race, religion, sexual orientation, have access to services that support their mental health. And I want to challenge other businesses and individuals to make a difference in the world by taking action to destigmatize 
mental health. We need as much help as we can possibly get. Developing resources and services and increasing access to those services for young people. And that is what the Mental Health Youth Action Forum is all about. Later today, these young leaders will be presenting some truly innovative ways to address the youth mental health crisis through uh, storytelling and media to a room of industry professionals from the media, entertainment, and tech spaces who can help them bring those ideas to life. For the past six weeks, the young leaders have been meeting to prepare the presentations they'll be delivering later today. We can't hear all of those ideas now, but we'd like to invite Juan, Diana, and Mahmoud to tell us about themselves and their work and give us a sneak peek at what to expect during the forum this afternoon. Juan, do you want to get us started? Yes, thank you, Just Selena. <laughs> I know, we're both. But I'm Juan Acosta, my pronouns are he, him, his. I was born in Jalisco, Mexico, and came to this country at age two, grew up in Woodland, California. Uh, today I can say with a lot of pride that I'm a gay man, but that pride I didn't feel when I was younger. I felt a lot of shame for being myself, and just the intersectionality aspect of who I am brought me a lot of mental health struggles. And when MTV started this amazing forum, I got connected to some incredible individuals in my group. We all came together because we believe in intersectionality, and we believe that people shouldn't feel broken for being who they are. And we realize that, thank you. We realize that it is not us as people who are broken, it is society that is broken. And we want people to find the okay and broken. And that is why we created a movement called the Broken Universe, where we want people to find the okay. And we plan to do so in three hubs. Our first hub will be through storytelling. We want people to share what is something that they felt shame for in the past and how they used it as their superpower, as everybody here has been using it today. And the second hub is to have a documentary, a series, where we have people from all backgrounds, celebrities, uh, people, students, and share their stories together because oftentimes people talk at one another but they don't speak with one another and we want to have those conversations. And the last hub is creating a metaverse where people are able to create avatars and have an online community where they feel seen and where they are connected with resources that represent them. So I just want to thank my incredible group. Do you mind me asking what it's like to work with people that have had the same journey as yourself? Are you able to feel like you have a more confident space to do that? Definitely. I feel really confident up here today, and I just feel really seen. And I think we all have a different background, but we all share the same struggle of knowing what it's like to feel like you're not okay and not knowing who to go to. And we came together with that purpose. We want to have other young people go to people and tell them, take them up in their head and tell them how they're feeling. So beautiful, thank you. Okay, and Diana, what can you tell us about the work that you and your group has planned this afternoon? For sure. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, allowing this to happen. I'm Diana Chow. Uh, like Juan, I'm an immigrant. I'm from a rural village in the poorest province of China. I grew up beneath the poverty line with parents who didn't speak English. And when I was 13, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder that also gave me an eye disease that made me permanently episodically blind. And it was when my little brother found me during my final suicide attempt that I started writing letters to strangers. And it started as a small student club at my high school, but is today the largest global youth for youth mental health nonprofit. <laughs> And I'm so grateful also for Dr. Murthy because we wrote the world's first Youth for Youth Mental Health Guidebook that cites and expands upon the Surgeon General's report from over 20 years ago. 
<laughs> and a free teacher's curriculum guide for Dr. Biden teachers. Uh, but anyway, so I am very, very grateful to have met incredible people through this forum who, you know, my group is working on an episodic show idea called Mind in Progress, because we're all works in progress. Uh, and the idea is to integrate the stories of youth activists, such as the incredible folks here, uh, with an expert in dialogue, and then ending each episode with a call to action that is sustainable, that the public can engage with and amplify. And the key thing is really to be conscientious about the need for sustainability, for long-term impact. So understanding the importance of context, of research, of wisdom from those who have long been in this space. Uh, and recognizing that at the end of the day, what we need to do is not to just be reactive to mental illness, but proactive about mental well-being. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about why it's so important for you to to kind of go into this space of mental health just because you're doing such incredible stuff. I would like to know how you're able to do that. I appreciate that a lot. Um, you know, as an ethnic minority from China, I'm a Buyi ethnic minority, um, you, I grew up in a very patriarchal society and when I was first thrown out of the house, I was six years old. And I think over time, I've realized that even though for so long, so many of us feel alone, it is that power of not just storytelling, but the implicit story listening that happens when someone hears you, sees you, is caring about you. That empathy builds a human connection that is so pure, <laughs> That is so hard to find in today's age. And so I am so grateful that, you know, you all are here to just give us this space because that space is what is so often in short supply. So thank you. And now, Mahmoud, tell us about what you've been working on, please. Thanks, Selena. It's an honor to be here uh, with everyone today. My name is Mahmoud Keter. I am an Egyptian immigrant, Muslim. I came to the States when I was 12 years old. And I spent the next decade struggling through depression, anxiety, and mainly because of racism and discrimination I experienced. And it pushed me to, to a point where I, I, I thought the only way to end the pain was to end my life. And I attempted to do so, and I'm so grateful to still be here, but so many young people are not. And that breaks my heart. And every, every second that passes by, young people are dying. So I'm so happy that we're doing this because it's critical and it's what drove me to take my pain and funnel it to be a change maker, starting an organization called Floramind with the mission of empowering young people through mental health education in schools and in the places they are the most. And so I am, I'm, I'm so excited. And our group that we've been working with the last six weeks, shout out to them, we have, um, our group's called Hidden Healers, and we're focused on culturally grounded healing. And the idea is that every single person in this room has something to offer to themselves, to their community, everyone who's not in this room as well. We've, we were talking about Uber drivers, we're talking about everyday people who interact with these people the most, and that we want to equip them, empower them, and highlight their stories, and bring together people like Selena, people like Dr. Murthy, people like Dr. Biden, and be able to bring everyone to say, you know, healing is not just in a therapist's office, and it's not just alone. There is this gray space that we need to address, and that's what we're trying to do. So we're doing it through three different ways. One is we're doing a Hidden Healers show. So you can imagine a rapper, a monk, and a, um, a, and a young person in one place talking about healing. Um, the second way we're doing it is through highlighting the stories of those people as well, putting on a social media campaign, and then the last way we're doing it is through education inside schools. We want to make sure that culturally grounded healing is uplifted. We are looking at the voices of young people. We're also looking at the voices of people of color and their ancestors and the healing that has not been uh, prioritized like other types of healing. So, yeah, thank you. I really like this idea that simple things can bring you, you know, that to that place. Could you tell us some simple ways that you've used? Absolutely. You know, one of the places our idea stemmed with, uh, me being Muslim, I pray five times a day. And this idea that if we look at our cultures and we look at simple ways 
to do that. So for me, that's prayer. Initially, I didn't think that was mental health. And it is mental health. That is healing. Your faith, your culture, community, peers, that's healing. So I do that as much as I can. I'm in supplication. I'm in du'a, prayer, I'm asking God for help. And that's, that's an incredible healing moment for me. And that's what we're trying to do for young people is to help them realize that. Amazing. Thank you so much. I'm very emotional. <laughs> and now we'll be, um, we'll be hearing more about these amazing ideas and others in much greater detail later this afternoon at the second part of the forum. So thank you to all of you young leaders so much for all the help that you guys do and the resources that you're able to be. I am so honored to be in your presence. Thank you so much. As we close, please remember that tomorrow, May 19th, is Mental Health Action Day, a day dedicated to driving our culture from mental health awareness to mental health action. Taking action to support your mental health can be as routine as taking action to support your physical health. If you don't know where to start, you can check out mentalhealthishealth.us. And please post about what actions you're taking by using the hashtag mentalhealthaction. The Mental Health Action Forum wouldn't be possible without the support of the nonprofit partners who are doing incredible work to support young people across our country. MTV Entertainment Studios, the U.S. Surgeon General, General Dr. Murphy, and of course, President Dr. Biden. Thank you guys so much for having me. Celine, I want to thank you and Dr. Murthy, but especially I want to thank all the young people here on the stage today for having the courage to share your stories. And I hope that this uh, conversation continues, that this isn't just a one-time thing, that we keep working on this because it's something obviously we have to work on, especially after the pandemic, I think. That's so, as a teacher, I see it in my own classroom. So I hope we, we continue this conversation. And um, I just want to just thank you for tomorrow's being Mental Health Day. I hope uh, everybody commits to an act of kindness. Because I think each and every day, just not Mental Health Day. So thank you all. Thank you to the audience for participating and being here. Thank you. Thank you.